Well, good morning, Grace family. All you happy people out there, so friendly. Man, someone, uh, someone texted me during the service, said, uh, yeah, you and Ed coordinated shirts today. I'm wearing the same shirt as Ed. A little different size. Also, Daniel, Daniel, our next gym pastor, he has actually the same shirt on, so it, it just worked out that way. Normally, people would go home and change, right? Yeah, but no, we're just going to push on through. Hey, guys, my name is Brian Myers, uh, one of the pastors here on staff. So happy to have you here this morning. We are uh, continuing this series as we talk about good news worth repeating, and uh, really excited to bring this message today as we're going to be in Romans 11. I think we live in a world, actually, I don't think, I know we live in a world full of just headlines and social media telling us everything that is wrong with the world, telling us what we should be angry about, what we should fight about, but really what we can proclaim as God's church is what's right with Jesus Christ. And so we gather today to celebrate that. Uh, today we're going to be in Romans 11 uh, in chapters, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verses 11 through 24. And we're going to look at how Paul is talking about botany, branches, and believers. It just worked out. It's there in the text. Trust me, you're going to find out. Uh, as far as in the text, you know, I'm excited because we get to talk about plants, about being grafted in. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but I, when I was 14 years old, my very first job was working at a nursery center. I was there from age 14 to age 17. Now, some of you might be like, how in the world did you get that job? All right. It was my smashing good looks. It was my charisma. It was all my knowledge, all, all 14 years of knowledge about plant life. And uh, it had nothing to do with my dad knew the owner. That, that was just a weird coincidence. But... I got to work at the nursery there, and it was a lot of fun. I, I had a great time. Uh, that's honestly where I learned how to drive stick, all right? Who knows how to drive stick out there? There you go. That should be, like, required, you know? But anyways, I learned how to drive stick uh, on a forklift, okay? And it was great. It was a safe environment, except for the, the forks, you know, that would go through pallets and product. But anyways, I had a great time, and I, I was hoping I could, like, take the, the forklift to the DMV, but they said it wasn't like street legal, but whatever. Uh, it, was, it was a way for me to have a good time, and I loved learning about plants. I honestly, not much of a green thumb, more of a black thumb. I've, I've known to kill some silk plants in my day, but my friend there, Bud, he loved hybrid plants. He loved taking um, fruit trees and making two-in-ones and three-in-ones, and he would take these fruit trees that would have like three different fruit that would grow on it. it it just amazed me. He could do all of these things. And so there, when I was at California Garden Center, I'm like, man, there's such a cool thing you can do creatively with botany and plants. And so today, Paul's going to talk about that. And this relates to being grafted in. You know, when you're at a garden center, you, you really are just hoping you can actually keep a plant alive. Um, for me, that's what I was hoping for. But my friend Bud, he kind of was like Frankenstein. He liked making new things and something that would actually uh, be something that he could enjoy, and fruit that he could actually enjoy with his family. So today, we're talking about the Jewish family, the faith family, like a family tree. And then we're grafted into that family as followers of Jesus. Now, we all come from different places. We all have different stories. But the beauty of the gospel is that God takes his faith family, where there were some broken branches, and he grafts in new branches, and we get to be a part of a new story in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much uh, for this time that we have to gather together in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that your son Jesus gave his life on a tree, on a cross, so that way we might be grafted into a family tree, God, that goes all the way back, Lord, to Abraham, uh, to the one who is the father of promise. So, so Lord, today I pray that, Lord, you would speak through me. I pray, Lord, that um, your word would be upheld, and I pray that Christ would be proclaimed. I pray, Lord, that if we feel disconnected, disjointed, and broken, that we'd feel and experience the power of being put into a right relationship by the work of Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you that this is not something uh, that I have done or that anyone here can do, but it's what your son has done by the cross. We thank you and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, we're going to be jumping like right into this uh, message. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. Uh, we are actually going to be reading from the ESV today in Romans 11. And so the first section of scripture we're going to be looking at is verses 11 through 14. Paul shares with them, So I asked, did they stumble in order that they may fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. 
Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Romans 11, 11 through 14. What we find in this passage is our very first fill-in today. This idea that one people's loss is another people's gain. That for one people, the Jews are, are broken off, estranged from God, that is the gain of those people who honestly had no opportunity to be included into the family of God. What's awesome is that God works all things together for our collective good and his glory, that God is, is working out a perfect plan. You see, the gospel went first to Israel, through Jesus, to the apostles, the nation of Israel rejected it, and then that message went to the nations. And the beauty is that Israel's rejection has ensured Gentiles or non-Jews adoption. My heritage is not Jewish. It's because the gospel was rejected in Israel that it went out to the nations. And I'm so grateful that the ripple effect of that rejection caused our adoption in places far off like Chico. You see, Jesus prophesied about this rejection Jesus would often share stories and parables. He would take everyday things that people were experiencing in life, and he would share a deeper spiritual truth. And so in Matthew 22, he shares about the story of a, of a great wedding banquet. Uh, the king invites his people to join him for the feast, for the celebration. I mean, he's excited. The king delights to share things with his people. And so what the people do is they don't respond. You know that RSVP thing you're supposed to respond to? You know you're out there. It's all good. I'm one of them too. You may not reply. You may not get back in time. And so he heard from no one. In fact, many rejected the rejection. So what he did is he sent a second invitation and he sent messengers out. And he wanted his people to know, hey, I've prepared for you a beautiful, wonderful feast. Finest meats, waiting for the celebration. Come. So as the messengers went out, people ignored it. They rejected it. Some full-blown seized the messengers and abused them, and some were killed. The king is furious. And so then what he tells his messengers with good news, he says, you know what, go out everywhere. And to all those, just move on from the insiders, let's go to the outsiders. Everyone who is not invited, invite them in to the celebration. You see, that's the nature of the gospel. That by insiders, the religious, rejecting the gospel, the good news, it goes out to the irreligious, and then the irreligious come to faith because of that rejection. And so Paul is sharing this story that Jesus spoke about way before this event of how God is going to redeem all people for his glory and our good. As far as how things went out, as we look in the scriptures, we have Acts, which is written by uh, the apostle Luke. He's one of Jesus' disciples. And so in him writing Acts, in Acts 2, we find the church established at Pentecost. So all the way from Acts 2 through Acts 28, which you have Paul preaching the gospel in Rome you have the gospel going out throughout the Mediterranean. And so from Acts 28 through Revelation, we're living out that story as a church. And many people would say, we're the Acts 29 church. That God is still taking the gospel message and making sure that it goes out to all places. And God is using us as messengers of good news to share the gospel with outsiders so that they might become insiders. That is good news. You see, the power is the power, I'm sorry, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and also the Greek. When we look at Paul and what he identifies in Romans 11, the nation's rejection ensured the inclusion of those who were Gentiles and family. This is good news worth repeating. I mean, this is why we're focusing on the gospel in this series is God has given you good news to share, so let's go share it. I think in verse 11, Paul references this stumbling that was referred to actually in Psalm 69. It was this prophecy in the Psalms. It says this stumbling wouldn't be forever. It was a, a temporary setback. They're down, but not out. Right now, in this season of their life as a nation, Israel is the underdog, and they would need a great comeback. I mean, don't we all love comeback stories? I mean, I mean we do. Like, cue like Mighty Ducks right here, or whatever movie where there's a great comeback. As people, we love comeback stories. And for me, I love a comeback story because seriously, I'm a Broncos fan. I, I've got nothing left. <laughs> seriously, the way we play these days, it's really rough. We're never ahead. We have to come back. But something has changed. I don't know if you heard. Denver Broncos bought a quarterback. We have Russell Wilson. Is that awesome? 
Like, how many of you guys are 49er fans in here? Any Niner fans? Yeah, the Broncos took Russell Wilson out of your division. Are you not happy? Yeah, you guys are all Broncos fans. This is great. So what I love about Russell Wilson is, like, before it was, like, hopeless. But now I'm like, we got Russell Wilson. We've got a chance. That sounds like a desperate fan, doesn't it? It does. Because for me, going into the season, there's hope. Even though you're down and out, there, there's, there's hope, there's this opportunity. Family, everyone is watching Israel right now. They look down and out. It looks hopeless, helpless. And what Paul is illuminating, he says, hey, don't worry. Don't worry. They don't, they don't only have a chance. They have a hope that is real. I will make good on my promises. In verse 14, Paul makes an interesting statement. He says that he hopes his ministry to the Gentiles, which is about God's grace, provokes like this jealousy. He wants his people to covet what he's sharing to see that life and the vitality of faith in their lives. You see, Paul is hoping that though he's a Jew preaching to the Gentiles, that his ministry to the Gentiles would excite, create curiosity, and create a desire for Jewish people to come to faith. You see, Paul wants to be this influencer among his people. He wants people to know that the good news of Jesus Christ really is good news. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but people make good money being influencers. I mean, if you th see things, you know, on, um, on uh, social media, YouTube, Facebook, you have people whose job is to convince you that you need something or you should follow something or subscribe. Uh, some of these influencers make really good money. And the whole premise of influencing or marketing is this. They're trying to sell you on the thing you have is not satisfying. And that thing that you, that you have is not good enough. And then they want to show you something that you don't have that you need to make you happy. And so what you need to do is you need to buy this, click this, follow this, and once you get that, you're going to be happy. The world has been selling us that ever since the garden, right? All the way since the, 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 the tree of knowledge and good and evil. It's been selling us that. But family, that stuff lets you down. Even we ourselves are looking for the new car, the new upgrade, that new thing that will make us happy and complete. And I'm telling you this, whatever you get that's of this earth, it will disappoint you. And you know where it will end up? In a landfill. It really will. That thing you feel like you need today, one day will fail you, and one day you will no longer have it because you realize you don't need it. But what Paul is sharing is not something he has to sell. I mean, any good person who's a sales agent will tell you, hey, this product sells itself. Family, the gospel in this world right now, it sells itself. I don't have to dress it up. I don't have to have some catchy thing to tell you to make it look good. Family, the gospel is good news in a world that is dying. The world we live in right now is being lied to constantly. The world we live in right now is being sold a false bill of sale, and you guys need to put your trust and remind people, you know what? The thing that we need in all of this, it's Jesus. Only Christ satisfies. And so Paul hopes that his story of going from Saul to Paul, going from persecutor to pastor, will spark or pique curiosity in his people. For centuries, the Jews have been under the yoke of, of law and religion. I mean, catch this. Do you know how many laws and rules they would have to follow to stay in covenant? 613. I'm not going to recite those for you, okay? I know you guys want to go to lunch. It's all good. But 613 laws and rules of what you have to do to remain in covenant. And now, Jesus simplifies everything. You see, for Jesus, he realizes that, you know what? It's about this relationship with my Father. And I'm going to give you this power in you by the Spirit. That way you can actually pursue me. Rather than avoiding all the things that are wrong, you actually can pursue what is right. right. You see, for the Jews, what they would have to do, they would have to constantly go to the temple, offer sacrifices, Family, church on Sunday, if you were a Jew, was a bloody place. They would have to follow and observe all the rituals, all the celebrations. They were told things they couldn't eat. That thing you really wanted to eat, you couldn't eat it. That thing you couldn't touch, those people you couldn't touch, you couldn't even be around them. Some of you are like, that sounds great. No. These were like lepers. These were people who were afflicted. It was someone who was bleeding and hurting. You, you, you couldn't touch them. I've just found in the Gospels that when these lepers and, and people who are hurting, they want to be healed, I really feel they want to be healed so they can be touched. Because we long for relationship. 
And Jesus cuts through all of that. That's what he did on the cross. And they were enslaved by their religion. You see, for Paul, he's under the law of grace. Paul wants to show that the guilt of his sin was satisfied on the cross, so now he can walk with gratitude and thankfulness, and now he responds by obedience. Not to be saved, but he obeys because he is saved. You see that difference there? That's the difference between religion and a relationship. And see, as far as the Jews, they were seeing the church blow up. I mean, they saw people coming to faith. I mean, Pentecost, good night. Thousands coming to faith over a period of days. Baptisms everywhere. Persecution forces people out. They go to the nations, and the Jews are watching their faith, and it looks dead. And Paul is hoping that they will say, you know what? I want that. That looks better. That looks more attractive. Family, this is where I want to break it down here for you guys. Actually, this part is for you, because actually, I didn't think about it until now. You guys have been given a message that is compelling. I want to encourage you to be like Paul, to get those around you for their interest to be piqued, for them to have a curiosity about your faith, but that only comes if you live out your faith. And so as you live out your faith with freedom and joy, not bringing condemnation or judgment, but freedom and joy, you get to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You get to tell them the reason behind your joy where in the moment, everything looks bad. Do it for the gospel. Paul continues in verses 15 through 21. For if their rejection means the, uh, the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches are broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who will support the root, but the root who supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. In verse 15, Paul expresses this great anticipation of his faith family coming to faith again in Jesus. He gets this vision of, like what we see in Ezekiel, the, the dry valley of bones coming to life and vitality. This Judaism that was dead is now made alive by the power and the work of Jesus Christ. That right now, God's people look and are spiritually dead because there is no life in religion, but in the last day, during the time of tribulation, that there will be those who come to faith in Jesus Christ, and even though everything in the world is going wrong, everything is right in them, and Paul cannot wait for this day, and he prays that they will wake up to their salvation. In verse 16, Paul talks about the first fruits of, uh, of the dough, all right, this traces all the way back to Genesis. If you look uh, with Cain and Abel, I think Genesis 4 deals with the very first murder, which is between two brothers. Makes sense, right? Like when you say, hey, the kids are fighting. How bad can it get? Pretty bad. What were they fighting for? And that's what we talk a lot about in our families. Like, what are you fighting for? Like, what's the reason for this fight? These two boys were fighting for the father's acceptance that Cain's sacrifice didn't necessarily say first fruit, but he gave an offering, a grain offering. It was rejected. But Abel's sacrifice, which was the first part and best part, that's why we talk about when we give, we give our best, not our change. We give the best because it all belongs to God. That he gave his first part and best part and God accepted his offering. It was like he had his acceptance. And I think we all long for acceptance I love that my acceptance is not found in what I do, but in what Christ has done. That Christ fulfilled the law. Christ lived the perfect life that I could not live. And so now, in light of that, he's saying that those Jews who were that first dough, which really was the first Jews that came to faith, the first part were holy, the rest will be holy. Which basically means that the rest of Jews that come to faith in Christ will also be received and will be included. And then he talks about uh, uh, branches and, and a root. And like, what's that? Well, most commentators uh, believe that that root is actually the patriarchs. 
uh, the fathers of Jewish faith. Uh, We find that throughout Genesis. We see that in Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were like the famous faith fathers for the Jews. And like, these were like their, their heroes, all right? This is their form of marvel, were these fathers of their faith. And these were the men they looked to. And so what he's saying is that all of us are grafted in to that and their promises and their life-giving contribution carries on to us. And so as we think about that, you, you think about we having a God of promises. God is not afraid to make promises. And here's the good news. Jesus and the Father, man, they keep those promises. They make good on it. The promise given to Adam and his sons as they were going out, it it said this in the scriptures. It said that they began calling on the name of the Lord. They realized that there's a creator, there's one who deserves worship, so they sought after the Lord. And then we find with Noah and his sons, after the the flooding of the earth, that God would no longer destroy the, the world by water, that God would hold his wrath back. I think it's striking that that water is what brought destruction, but family Birth in the spirit by water, which is why we baptize by water, brings life. And so this promise is conveyed to us. And I'm so grateful that God's wrath is not storing up against me because the wrath against Brian family was on the cross, all right? Where is your sin? Was it on the cross? Because if it's not, it's building up. And I'm so grateful at that day of judgment, God's wrath is not going to be poured out on me. I am free. I'm free. It was on the cross but that's by the promise given to Noah. Next, you're recipient of the promise to Abraham where he told Abraham that you're gonna be the father of many nations. As many, as many stars as there are in the sky, that's how many descendants you're gonna have. That's a lot, especially when you don't have a kid. It's unfathomable. And Dave's gonna talk about that next week. That God will make good on his promises and so Abraham would be the father of many nations. Now, Isaac, the promise was conveyed in Genesis 26 not to go to Egypt. He told Isaac that that uh, all the nations on the earth would be blessed. Family, I, I, I'm just gonna be honest. I know we go through hard times, but we are blessed and highly favored when we're in Jesus Christ. Like we feel like we don't have, we feel like, man, there's something I need and, 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 and it's not being provided. God is gracious with us. God gives us all that we need. Scripture says in Rome is, man, if, if God didn't hold back his own son, son, Jesus, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Like, we think God only looks out for our salvation, but he doesn't care about the small stuff. God, guys, God cares about everything. That's why he's turning water into wine at weddings. You're the recipient of the promise of Jacob. Jacob was one who wrestled God for the blessing, wrestled an angel for a blessing. And so he wouldn't stop until he got that blessing. Literally says that he, his hip got out of socket. He walked with a limp. Family, I see some of you. You walk with a limp. Walk with pride. Let that be swagger because you wrestled with God. That's why Jacob's name changed from Jacob to Israel. He who wrestles with God. So the question is, do you wrestle? Are you struggling? Grace is a church where there are no perfect people allowed, myself included. We're, we're, a, we're a group of imperfect people who are who are wrestling with the perfect love of God that changes us from the inside out. And guys, we are a people of promise because of what Jesus did. You see, you have the the tree that is being grafted, these branches being grafted in, this olive tree. We're thinking of this literal olive tree, but family, we've been grafted in by the tree, the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is what makes you included in the faith family. Which leads us to our next point. Your belonging is no excuse to belittle the branches. You may pride yourself thinking, oh, I'm, I'm happy I've got my faith. Man, they're lost, but I'm not. I know who I am. And then have this pride and this arrogance. The challenge in the culture of the day uh, at the time that Paul was writing is there was so much friction, so much division between Jews and Gentiles. Those Gentiles that were coming to faith and even the Jews that were coming to faith, they were the source of, 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 of persecution, that, that Jews were coming at them. And so there was this resentment that was forming between Christians and Jews. And what Paul was saying is, do not boast in your faith. Do not be proud. In this passage, Paul reminds us that, that pride has no place in a Christian because our faith is not about what we've done or even who we are. It's not like God said, oh, I want that included in the tree. I want that, so I'm gonna add it in. 
No, it's the fact that you were added in that even gives you value and worth. There's nothing about you that made you special other than how special God sees you are. Which is why as followers of Jesus, we need to remind people the worth of people is not defined by us. It's defined by God. That's why all life is sacred and precious. Jesus and Paul would remind us to worry less about others and to focus on yourself. Your job is, is to abide, is to abide as a, as a branch does into the tree, or as Jesus would say, uh, you know, a branch into the vine. You know, that we would be rooted and that we would have that sustenance and that nourishment that comes from a root and a, and a grounding that is solid. And so he's reminding us that just focus on yourself. Don't worry about other people. It kind of reminds me with, like when people are driving NASCAR, okay? I don't have the courage to do that, so I'll just watch it on TV. And when they drive, man, they, they watch their line. They watch their line. They, they watch where they're going. They start looking next to or behind. They crash. Family, focus on your faith. Watch your line. Stay the course to the finish line, guys, and you will finish well. And so Paul is trying to shake some sense into them. Stop worrying about others. Worry about yourself. Abide in Christ. And as far as pride, God is so set against pride. Why? Because it makes us God and not him. It brings glory to ourselves and not him. We find this in Proverbs 3.34 that Solomon says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Family, if you want grace, humble yourself. He will exalt you. Whatever you need, if you come at it with humility, man, he will provide for you. He is faithful. Like God is so serious about pride that he, he's opposed to it. He hates it. And that's why Jesus was so bothered, so righteously angry about the Pharisees all throughout the Gospels because they had this pride and this arrogance in their righteousness and not the Lord. See, grace is this profound understanding that it's something given to you. It's not like God is obligated. It's not like you earned it or deserve it. It's been freely given to you, so be grateful. And there's times in your life where things happen where you know it's by God's grace alone. It has nothing to do with what you did. Man, I'll never forget, uh, on April 12th, 2019, we had Matthew West come to Grace Community Church. Who was here for the Matthew West concert? How many like, I missed out? Yeah, I know. I, I, I was shocked. Uh, uh, one of our friends, Phil, Phil Morgan, said, hey, uh, we can get Matthew West. He, he had something come up to where the way the traveling worked, I think something fell through, and he just wants a place where he can do a set. Can he come to Grace? I'm like, let me pray about it. Yes, yes, get him out right away. So I was just, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, like, I heard it on the radio, Matthew West, Grace Community Church. I'm like, I mean, it was, it was hard not to go, oh, that's awesome, that's totally cool. Then when Matthew West came, I'm like, I'm talking to Phil, hey, can I go in his room? Like that little side room there, you know, because at that point, it's no longer mine, it's his, all right? And so anyways, I, I went in there, and, uh, and Matthew West was there. Uh, I think my daughter Amanda was there too. So there I am, just like talking to Matthew West. And you know, me and Matt, we're like buds. We're like tight. We're tight. You know, I text him. He doesn't get back. Guy's busy. But anyways, uh, we hung out for 20 minutes. It felt like 20 years for, for him, not me. But uh, man, I, I, I was, at the same time I was there, and I'm thinking like, man, what do I talk about? You know, a uh, little starstruck a little bit, just to be honest. Like full disclosure here. I hope he doesn't watch this video. That'd be awkward. But anyways, uh, so I'm making small talk. Then after he, he, he left, after we prayed, you know, uh, Missy says, uh, I'm sorry, Amanda goes, that was fun, Dad. I'm like, yeah, that was fun. I said, did I seem awkward? She said, no, not really. I'm like, not really. She's like, no, you kind of were like in uh, like a cool pastor mode. I'm like, that's awkward. I'm still in cool pastor mode or trying to be. I don't know. But I was there and I was just thinking like, man, how cool. And then it was a great night. But to be honest, what was special about that night was it was in April of 2019. We had so many people who were just recovering on the front stages of uh, the campfire. We had that and another concert, several concerts that I can't even tell you why they happened, but by God's grace. I'm telling you, it wasn't me. It wasn't grace. It wasn't even this room. To be honest, some of these artists, like, their stage is as big as this room. But the fact that he came here 
for me, showed that God cares and loves his people because he cares about the people of paradise and the people of Chico. And that was so healing. And so as they left and, and uh, he went away and I just reflected, it just reminded me of God's grace. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. You just receive it and enjoy it. And family, everything in life should be that way. All the good stuff in life, all those things that you think you didn't know, it's the Lord. All those great experiences of what you've received, it's the Lord. Family, we have much to be thankful for. That was such a sweet moment. Uh, Paul continues on in verses 22 through 24. Note then the kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, and even they, if they do not continue in their uh, disbelief. While being grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree you see, this is a startling passage for many people because as you read this, Paul's trying to shake some sense into them to let them know, don't be proud and arrogant about your salvation because salvation is from God, not from you. In the moment where you think it's you and what you've done, you become like that dead wood, no life. And that's what happened with the nation of Israel. They lost sight of who it was about. It's about Jesus Christ. You know, as we look at this wild wood being rooted into this natural wood. Guys, we are like the wild olive branches, all right? Wild people. I see a room full here, okay? That's the nature that we get grafted in by the gospel, and it's God's work in and through us. So for the church at Rome, the religious Jews were seen as enemies. If there was anyone that they uh, would fear, they would fear the Jews because they were the ones who would persecute. Paul gets them to change their paradigm. Gets them maybe to think about the big picture, the long view of what God is doing, that God desires everyone to come to him, especially his people. And so as they lift their vision that Paul doesn't want them to see the Jews as enemies, but actually lost family. That God wants your anger and your judgment to turn to empathy and compassion. That God wants the same heart that was on the cross in Jesus to say that, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Friends, all those people in your life that maybe don't get you, maybe give you a wrong rub or, or, or some opposition, family, they're not your enemy. They're people that need Jesus. And what, may we pray for them. May we pray for them. And even when Jesus said to pray for your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you, Jesus even says that they may know that you are children of the Father, your ability to love unlovable people is what defines you being a child of God. Why? Because you were unlovable. And honestly, at times, are you unlovable? Yes. We all deal with that, but God is steadfast in his love for us. But what about this? Does this mean that some people won't be saved? Like, like God's gonna like, like break off disobedient people? Well, no. We have to look at the text and what it's saying here. It's really focusing on what is the evidence and what, is, what should it really look like for those who are led by faith for those who are grafted in. We also look at texts like John 6 where Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me but raise it up on that last day. Ephesians 1 also reminds us that family, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. You cannot lose your salvation. If anything, what Paul is trying to do here is to shake them up to get them to come to compassion and kindness. Because God loves you, you need to be loving to others because you have a heart that loves. The patience that you can have with, with people who are difficult or challenging, that patience is given to you by the heart that God gave you. That kindness that leads people to repentance, that kindness is given to you by God. And you've been called to share that with others. You see, this passage here is not intended to highlight God's judgment, but rather God's redemption. If God is able to graft in unnatural branches, branches that don't belong, people like you, people like me, that he assuredly can graft in those natural branches one day. God is more than able, which leads us to our last point here. God is patient and faithful in his promises. When I first came to Christ... I just rooted myself in the New Testament. I'm like, uh, old covenant, old news, a lot more reading. <laughs> I'm gonna move on, I'm just gonna read the New Testament. 
just really stick on the red letters of Jesus. But then as I grew in my faith in Jesus, I realized this, that I was adopted in to a faith family, that their story now becomes my story. Like Eliana, we, we adopted her from Haiti, that her being adopted into our family, now our family, our heritage is her heritage. God help her. But seriously, we get to be a part of this rich story that we live out, and so we are now a part of a faith family. And you may think, man, God, why don't you just come? Why don't you just come today? I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. Why? Because he's waiting for the last one to come to repentance. Aren't you glad he waited for you? I'm glad, it, I'm glad that God waited until August of 1993 before he came back, all right? So I've been out, but now I'm in Christ Jesus. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That God is patient with us, waiting for the last one to come to salvation, and when that day comes, the Lord comes. Even so come. God's love for Israel is reflective of God's love for us. And so, so where are you in this, all right? For some of you, you are like a branch, and you just feel broken. The only way that you are going to find life and vitality is by being grafted into the family tree of Christ Jesus. It goes all the way back to Abraham. That that is your source of life, your source of sustenance. Family, the only way you can find life is by abiding in Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you feel, you know, I, I got some hurt. I've got some resentment going on right now. I know the word says I'm a beloved child, but I don't feel loved. I feel like right now that I'm, I'm not loved by people. I, I'm struggling with feeling loved by God. Family, the only way that's going to change is if we find that we abide in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Stop focusing on what's wrong with this world. Stop focusing on what is wrong with other people. And you need to look in you and realize what's wrong in you. Family, you need Jesus and so today as we wrap up, I want to encourage you, let this scripture that might seem disconnected because it seems like it's about another people, but now you realize this isn't about someone else, it's about you. I pray that through God's kindness and his love to you, that you would be patient with others, and our prayer would be that one day all of God's people would be together, grafted in as a tree in Christ Jesus. Because we have a God, who's, a God of promises God who's faithful. And the reason that I am confident of my salvation and I'm confident that I'm secure until the day of my redemption is because God is faithful to his people, the people of Israel. Let's worship.